The idea for this paper came from the material irony of the Duke of Buckingham's death. In 1628, a year after being the alleged victim of a murder attempt involving a dagger during the military expedition on Ile de Ré, Buckingham, who was then preparing a new uh, expedition to the island, was stabbed to death with a dagger by John Felton, a veteran of the first Ray expedition. The dagger was used by both the victim and his assassin. Buckingham tried to use the first dagger as a propagandist object of self-aggrandizement, while Felton used it to punish what he thought was Buckingham's tyrannical treachery. The dagger changed hands, but also changed forms, and seemed to play a defining role in the political ontology of Buckingham. Relying, relying sorry, on a literary approach to the material artefacts and non-fictional texts, this uh, paper probes into the role of military objects in the creation of a specific male political identity. It analyzes the relationship of three objects, the armor, the dagger, and the current of news, with the masculine subjects in Martin's portraits of Buckingham and two issues of a proto-newspaper, a continued journal, celebrating the Duke's military actions. This primary corpus will be confronted with other texts uh, played by Thomas Hayward and diplomatic letters, and above all, with early Stuart libels. This paper follows Baudrillard's views of objects as social tactics and analyzes the role of weapons as tactical processes of invention or reinvention of the political male self. It discusses the formal and the physical circulation of the object and how the object's mobility can be a source of instability, leading to the destruction of the political subject. The presentation offers first to explore the problematic materiality of Buckingham's self-representation as a courtly soldier. It will then focus on Buckingham's attempt to render the paradigm of the courtly soldier active through a material narrative of the uh, murderous dagger. The, ro- the examination of the role of the dagger and its textual circulation will finally show how mobile objects eventually participate in the failure of Buckingham's political and sexual self-fashioning. After the threat of impeachment in 1626 and his various diplomatic and certain gestures regarding France, Buckingham's political style was fading quite rapidly. His sartorial flamboyance had become a weapon against Charles' favourite and a sign of political weakness. This 1627 libel that you can see on the slide about Buckingham's failure uh, in Cadiz and on the Ile de Ré illustrates the unpopularity of the Duke. The libel, as noted by Bellany, particularly stresses the public opposition to the fusion of the warrior and the courtier and the subsequent view that courtliness had effeminated the Duke and made him unfit to command. Due to celebrate uh, uh, Buckingham's actual military career as Lord High Admiral, this portrait, uh, you see on the slide, actually proves to be the perfect illustration of Buckingham's choice of the paradigm of the courtly soldier. Let's focus first on the metal objects in the portrait and how the armour and the weapon participate in the inherent failure of Buckingham's paradigm. The three-quarter cavalry armour and the Papanayama rapier on display here match the military fashion of the 1620s and 30s, as you can see on the uh, right-hand side of the slide. The practical timeliness of the object stresses the functional aspects of the armour rather than its ceremonial nature. However, the ceremonial aspect re-emerges in antithetical details that jeopardize the potential agency of the armor in this portrait. See, the helmet behind Buckingham appears to be a functional one, although the plume and the absence of metal collar replaced in the picture by the ruff plead for parade rather than battlefield. Similarly, the counter on Buckingham's left arm still testify to a luxury armor produced with great care and craft. Carolyn Springer emphasizes three important characteristics of early modern armor, the transferability of the object, its juxtaposition sorry, of masculine power and feminine vulnerability, and its relationship with time. The temporal factor is the one that proves to be the initial operative element uh, in the failure of uh, Buckingham's paradigm of masculinity. Indeed, in the early decades of the 17th century, the transition to firearms is rendering armors increasingly obsolete on the battlefield. 
the temporal flaw of the pictorial armor here uh, generates an imbalance between battlefield made power and vulnerability, and the armor is now endowed with an unstable interpretative transferability. Buckingham's problematic pro uh, military masculinity lies in its untimeliness and the untimeliness of all its defining objects. It tries to fuse a contemporary yet operationally obsolete armour with the old medieval model of the courtly soldier expressed through sartorial objects. Yet the military value of the armour is compromised by the excess of fabric in the painting. The prestige draperies uh, behind Buckingham, the multicolored baldric, the blue sash of the Order of the Garter, are common indicators of wealth and male stages, but they also parasite the metal expression of masculine strength. The fabric indeed is static here, purely ceremonial, and its curves prove to be more signals of sensuality than military strength. Moreover, the blend of metal and fabric is uh, also emblematic of the stock figure of the courtly soldier. The untimely model chosen here endangers the masculine subject as it is derived from medieval romances and uh, more particularly from Chanson de Toile, a uh, song sung by women, two women, while they were weaving. So it's a genre attached to femininity, both in terms of addresser and addressee. Besides, the rhetorical choice of the uh, uh, figure of the courtly soldier reflects a problematic male exemplarity that is similar to the late medieval and Renaissance moralizations of female exemplar. The double material expression of Buckingham's masculine fortitude creates a form of isolation of the subject from its social, sexual, and historical context that renders its political existence almost impossible. The epideictic value of the sartorial allegory of the courtly soldier proves destructive as subjectivity is made way too exceptional to be performative. The rupture between Buckingham's model of masculinity and his own historical time is actually illustrated in this uh, excerpt from Hayward's The Royal King and the Loyal Subject. The play features an interesting discussion of the temporality and the materiality of the soldier. Cock, the boldly named clown, enters the stage and discusses the time of masculinity as he opposes courtier and soldier. The play was performed quite regularly between 1606 and 1618 and reflects a contemporary view of the courtly soldier still bearing Castiglione's influence. Cox's portrait uh, features a, uh, the same object, actually, as in the, uh, the previous Buckingham portrait. However, its rhetoric of antithetical parallelism presents the premise of a timely masculinity alternating military and courtly materiality. The contrapuntist style of this speech signals that the courtier and the soldier can only be part of a diachronic discordia concourse, not a synchronic one. Where the painting failed to provide a sense of timeliness, the construction of a dramatic anamorphosis expressing coincidence through successiveness contributes to the comic portrait of a more stable masculinity. So the temporal problem of Buckingham's ontology seems to be its synchronic nostalgia somehow, the latter preventing any form of performativity. Buckingham's strategy is completely at odds with uh, Cox's advice, actually, in this, uh, uh, the end of this very speech, that one should uh, fashion himself or oneself wholly to the humours of the time. According to Salvetti, an agent of the Duke of Tuscany, Buckingham was so much disliked by nearly the whole country. Such was, actually, the humour of his time. Buckingham's 1627 expedition to Ile de Ré was part of a material strategy to regain public affection. The Ré expedition was thus backed by both a visual and a textual propaganda campaign whose point was to counter the circulation of death wish poems like the ones at the bottom of the, uh, the slide. The point was to remake, actually, Buckingham's image of the courtly soldier. Polo Finland writes that things need not to be entirely concrete or material. Even objects can, cannot be solely defined by their materiality. And indeed, Buckingham's propaganda uh, relies 
propaganda strategy, sorry, did not only involve concrete sartorial parading, uh, as you could see in Salvetti's second quotes here, that he, in the streets of Portsmouth and London, Buckingham used to love parading in his military gear. And, uh, but it wasn't enough. Actually, the Buckingham's propaganda strategy relied also on the transliteration of a weapon in order to create a fictional yet performative concreteness that could be finally circulated to a greater number. The vehicle for this was the temporary venture of Thomas Walkley's A Journal of All the Proceedings, a publication set to rival the Mercurius Britannicus. The journal was aptly only published between August and November 1627, the time lapse of the Ray expedition, under the title, this very long title that I'm not going to read because we're running out of time. Any bore the mention published by authority. This mention can be read as Cox, uh, Cox, Coxwell, sorry, uh, reads it as an instance of a tightening of uh, censorship but it should also be read in the light of the laudatory subtitle on the frontispiece. The journal was actually just a propaganda vehicle for the Duke's political and religious virtue and aimed to seduce its readership. It was a craftily uh, uh, prepared venture by Buckingham and his entourage. The, uh, the journal was published as a current of news, an increasingly popular format during the Thirty Years' War as a short folio about, of about 2,000 words with one or two columns of news on each side of the page, the Coranta form was actually calibred to mirror and answer the stinging brevity of all the anti-Buckingham libels. Moreover, the Coranto, and actually this one, uh, Walkley's Coranto, bore news about military and diplomatic bre uh, actions that were normally and legally inaccessible to a general audience. Thus, this very Coranto gave the reader the same illicit thrill than a libelous text. The Coranto uh, actually gives some thingness to the event. It is an artifactual text. It engages the reader's senses uh, thanks to a uh, use, quite a, a prominent use of uh, material description, and also thanks to the phys physical circulation from hand to hand. Beside the concrete materiality of the circulated journal, the strategy to validate Buckingham's masculine model also relied on the material redefinition of the courtly soldier by the then popular trope of the martyred soldier. You can see they were so popular they became a play ma acted many times by Henry Shirley. Hence, the first Corantos of the series of five Corantos feature three accounts by two different witnesses of the attempted murder of Buckingham by a French soldier. Yet, instead of presenting a vulnerable, hence feminine, wounded body, the textual and visual focus is on the murder weapon, a more virile signifier force. The physicality of the martyred hero is meant to be achieved through materiality. In this first excerpt from the first Coranto, the literary strategy is to create a military blazon for Buckingham, uh, which is going to be centred on the alleged murder weapon, the dagger, and then to turn Buckingham into a Protestant martyr. The text opposes the disciple of Jesuits to Buckingham, who is first presented through a metonymic analogy. The weapon is described as a long, ravillac like knife poisoned, infuses the presentation of the murderer and the victim through the name Ravillac, alluding both to the assassin and to Henry IV. The reference to actually to Ravillac and to poisoned were uh, intended to reverse the accusations of regicide against Buckingham himself relayed by the pamphlet you can see on the left, uh, uh, 1626 pamphlet. Buckingham is now the martyr Huguenot king by proxy in the Coranto, and his symbolic martyrdom is reinforced by the conclusion of the episode, which shows a merciful Buckingham, reminiscent of Christ on the cross, uh, granting pardon to his executioners. The weapon became the locus of the material performance of Buckingham's self-fashioning as uh, defender of, Protestant, of the Protestant faith. The construction of the blazon of the martyr, uh, martyred courtly soldier is given, actually, an augmented reality in the second Coranto. 
The Quranta now associates Ress and Werber as the basis of a classical forensic rhetoric combined with an epideictic style in order to increase the tangibility of, and the veracity of both the object and the, uh, the event. As in a judicial exhort, the account of the attempted murder uses brevity and clarity because of the format of the Quranto and its size. It also uses circumstantial specificity thanks to the different dates that you can see mentioned on the various pages. It's actually from the same Quranto. That's the frontispiece, that's the first illustration, the second page, and then the first page of the newspaper. It also uses Enargea by stressing the vividness of the pictorially and textually transliterated dagger. It insists on its length, breadth, having four edges, and the fact that the, uh, uh, the drawing, the portraiture, was supposed to represent exactly the size of the dagger. Plus, it alluded and uh, gave that augmented reality uh, by alluding to the circulation from nominated hand to hand, from Buckingham to Captain Buxton to even the Duchess of Buckingham. The point is clearly to overcome an anticipated resistance and to set a contrast with the concluding gesture of grandeur of Buckingham pardoning his murderer, well, so-called murderer. However, the manipulation of the dagger to create a fictional political subject is jeopardized by the problematic circulation of the criminal object and the criminal subject himself. Indeed, the assassin at the end was sent back to France while the dagger was sent to England, as if the dagger was actually reaching its intended target while the murderer was sent home safe. Such strange procedure cast doubt over the truth of the murder attempt. The dagger and the Coranto uh, were seen, actually, even at the time, as contrived materiality. An object's value is always redefined by its circulation, because circulation frees the object from the political subject commanding it and places it in the hand of the readers now. As prophetically suggested by the Ravillac analogy, the object gains, finally, a form of ontological uh, independence that will turn against the subject circulating it. Considering objects always means to uh, trace the consumption, ooh, sorry, as well as the production. The dagger is a transliterated object whose production is at odds completely with its uh, reception. The initial alteration of the dagger into a transliterated object destabilizes the signifier and opens the possibility to reallocate its intended signifiers. The reception, actually, of the Coranto, the contemporary reception, illustrates the rejection of the image of Buckingham as courtly soldier and the transformation of all the military objects into criminal objects. Actually, the collision between uh, the, the sort of uchronic time of the martyred courtly soldier that we saw in the, uh, in the Buckingham portrait uh, with the historical time and uh, the, of the reception of uh, the episode of the dagger, is first noticed and reinforced by the diplomatic glosses of the episode, both actually the Italian one, the Venetian one, and English uh, diplomatic glosses. As you can see in the slide, uh, the Venetian ambassador, Contarini, reports the, uh, the event and focuses on the circulation of the dagger as uh, evidence of virtue, it's, uh, it's supposed to celebrate fortitude and resilience. Yet the interesting part is the one in italics here, because it's, uh, the italics actually indicates the parts of the text that were ciphered at the time and contain the actual analysis of the event. The ambassador's commentary confirms the tactical aspect and the dubious nature of Buckingham's transliterated weapon. Similarly, Henry Vick, who was actually a protégé, Henry the Vick, who was a protégé of uh, a Buckingham, seems to uh, uh, doubt the veracity both of the event and of the dagger. The political uh, readership was not doubting the existence of the dagger, but seemed to raise questions about its contextual use. The other limits of the Coranto's endeavor is to have overlooked the danger of the creation of a military blazon of martyrdom. The blazon of the dagger in its various transliterated versions can act as dismembering textuality. The dagger's metonymy for the martyred soldier again provokes the dangerous isolation of Buckingham, who's now turned into a silent textual object of praise, or rather, contempt. 
these threats is actually echo in several libels. If you look at the first one on the, on the slide, you can see that it's actually quoting and deforming the first Quaranto. It uses the word mean and, uh, for mainland, which echoes uh, uh, the first Quaranto that said that the assassin had been sent over into the main. The libel poetically transforms Buckingham's grace into treachery. The textual dialogue between the Carantos and the libels create what Bactins define as an event of utterance. The latter emphasizes the social uh, conflict between the political subject and his audience and refer reverses the epideictic goal of the transliterated object from the condemnation of a regicide object in the beginning to the celebration of a tyrannicide object in the end. The dagger uh, is now given two distinct material existences on, existences on paper, and the circulation of its visual avatars create a space for a critical discussion of political subjectivity. The confrontation of materiality and political subjectivity is truly an epistemology of the political subject, both in its collective and its individual form. The successive transliteration of the knife poisoned have, read, have rendered the killing potential of the weapon performative and have contributed to destroy Buckingham's courtly military masculinity. So as a conclusion, maybe Buckingham should have uh, actually remembered Castiglione's advice that a good soldier knows how to tell the smith what fashion his armour ought to have but cannot show how it is to be made that's maybe what he should have done with that faithful dagger. Thank you.